Hi, I'm Jan Ozer. I'm here at NAB. One of the things I was really impressed with when I was at the ATEM booth, at TEM booth, hi, I'm Jan Ozer. I'm here at NAB. One of the things I was really impressed with was at the ATEM booth when I saw the new Apple Vision Pro and I saw what they're calling spatial video. So you see a video that, that you can look up a certain distance and then it stops. You can look down a certain distance, it stops, and then 180 degrees this way. But it's a very vivid experience. And then I came to the Vnova booth where I am right now and I saw the presence technology. And presence is full 360 VR and it's got a lot of technical things in it that differentiated from what we saw at Apple or what I saw at Apple. And, and now I'm meeting with Tristan Salome, who is with Vnova, and he's going to explain to us what we see in the Apple Vision Pro, what we see with Six Degrees of Freedom, and how that is implemented, what you have to do to shoot for it, what you have to do to play it, what you have to do to encode it. So Tristan, thanks for joining me. You're welcome. So when I'm looking at the Apple Vision Pro, and nobody's trying to denigrate the Apple Vision Pro, but if I'm looking at spatial video, what am I seeing? So basically what you're seeing is kind of a perfect uh, stereoscopic or 3D screen in front of you. Uh, it's perfect because the Apple Vision Pro knows where your eyes are, and so it's able to project a perfect stereoscopic or 3D image to your eyes. Um, giving you, because of the difference of the, the image we have from the left and the right eye, that's what gives you basically the sensation of depth. But it is different from a Six Degrees of Freedom movie or a volumetric or truly immersive movie in the sense that it, doesn't, it cannot actually change your perspective on the movie. Like a, like a standard 3D TV kind of change the perspective you have on it. So it means that in real life, when we're making movements, so if I'm translating myself, if I'm moving like this, I do have a slightly different perspective on the things I'm looking in real life. My brain is used to that, and so to have the feeling of being there with a, a six-duff movie or the feeling of being there in an immersive movie, I need the movie to react properly to my head movement and to slightly change the perspective I have on things. And that's what Six, of Free, six Degrees of Freedom is doing. So when you, when you talk about Six Degrees of Freedom, what are those six degrees? Yeah. So the three first degrees that we share with, uh, with the uh, special computer, well, with the special images is the rotation. So basically it's the pan, the tilt, and the roll. So that's the three first degrees of freedom. And then the three extra degrees of freedom, making six in total, are the three translation, so X, Y, and Z. So that's what basically six degrees of freedom means that we can both rotate and translate. Okay, so when I was looking at a movie in, in the Apple Vision Pro, if I moved my head back and forth like this, the movie came with me, but I didn't go into the movie, I didn't come out of the movie. When I looked at it in six degrees of freedom, I could actually turn my head and look around objects to see what's behind them, which was totally new and made it, made it feel really realistic. What's it going to take to actually shoot videos that are distributed or experienced with six degrees of freedom in, in presence? So um, you need to actually collect this information of that. So you have two different ways to create those six degrees of freedom movies. The first is to start with something which is already CGI. So uh, something like a Pixar or ILM or Weta movie where you already have something which is in CG, in 3D, and then we can compute, we can basically add to the standard pipeline of movie creation, of 3D movie creation, a plugin which allows to, instead of just creating a 2D image of, of those 3D assets and of 3D scenes, to create a volumetric image out of it. So that's, if you ha do have some kind of IM 3D assets, it's kind of easy to create those volumetric movie. That's for CG content, let's say. And then if you have real life content, it is also possible to shoot basically an actor from a, a, an array of camera all around the actor, and then we can process those different images coming from those different point of view to recreate a 3D moving, um, object corresponding to the person. So basically we recreate a 3D model of the actor with texture which is in movement. And then from there we're in CG again in a way and we can again render it in, uh, in a Six Degrees of Freedom uh, presence uh, format. What's the resolution of video that I'm looking at? Because I did notice it wasn't 100% as crisp as what I've seen. Was that a function of 
the compression or a function of the format itself? So it's it's a bit of both. So uh, the the format itself right now we're more or less an equivalent of 6K, but it could be pushed actually further than that. But it's true that, and some of the content you saw actually was a bit of a earlier days content, which was not completely anti-alias, let's say, properly, but it's possible to actually push the envelope more than that. And some of it is linked to a bit of the of the compression behind it, because okay. it's a lot, sorry, it's a lot of data actually. Okay, so tell us about the compression. We're here in the VNOVA boost, so we know it's LCEVC. What role is the compression playing in both um, encoding the movie, but also making it distributable to people who aren't attached to a, to a, car, uh, uh, a big computer with a big GPU? Correct. So we do need compression at two levels. The first level is to compress the data itself. So the data in this volumetric movie in the presence format is actually points forming a point cloud. So instead of having 2D pixels uh, forming a 2D image, we do have points in space which are forming a volumetric image. So that's the, that's the raw data. And we do have a special way to collect them and to display them to make them look good. But the data is a moving point load. And so this moving point load data represents quite a lot of, of data per frame and per second. It's a lot. So it needs to be compressed. So Vinova is acting at two levels of compression. The first is compressing the movie itself, so the data of, of this point cloud movie was moving point cloud. And then for the distribution to allow people to basically stream the content to their headset, uh, we're also using LCEVC as a compression for the video to be pixel stream. Maybe I should explain a little bit the concept of the pixel streaming. So. Let's say you have your virtual ETA headset on your head. The virtual headset can actually compute what's your position in space. It will send this position to a remote server, which could be in the cloud, close by. The server will compute two images corresponding to your current position in space, current position and orientation in space. And those two images will be sent back to the, will stream back actually to the headset to be displayed in front of your eyes. And the will loop in the end makes you feel like you're inside this, this, this movie with the possibility of, of movement, six degrees of freedom, changing your perspective and having a true feeling of being inside it without any discomfort, without any cyber sickness. It's, I would say, it, I want to say it's discomfort, but I mean, it is, you're shocked by when things come at you because it really feels like they're, they're going to hit you. Um, what do you need to play this? So I, what is the headset? Tell me about that and then tell me about the computer it has to be attached to. Okay. So the headset itself, uh, it's a kind of it's a standard VR headset. Here you were using a Quest 3 headset from Meta. It will work also on a Quest 2 headset. Uh, it could be actually streamed also to the AVP, so to the Apple Vision Pro. Uh, or it could be cool to, to be Scream out 3 to other kind of headset like the Pico 4 headset as well. So we're kind of agnostic on the headset itself. Uh, as for the computer, which is uh, rendering the images, computing the images according to your position, uh, you need a medium sized PC, VR PC ready computer. Uh, so if I take the latest NVIDIA cards, it will be around the 4060 uh, NVIDIA card that you will need to actually run it. So how does this scale? I mean, where do you see this going from a, from a broadcast slash movie perspective? So the scanning should be, so the scanning could come from different, uh, different things. So one of the scanning is actually to have, since the, 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 the graphic card need is getting lower and lower, uh, you will have more PC VR expense and PC gamer, which will be able to, to run it. But we think that the bit scale will more come from what we call the pixel streaming. So actually, uh, being just with a, a VR headset, which could be $300, something like that, $400, and then have something which is streamed uh, from the uh, from the cloud uh, to you. And thanks to actually to LCEVC, so the uh, the special uh, enhancement compression layer uh, from Vinova, we're able to hit something like 25 to 30 megabits per second for the streaming. So the kind of bandwidth that anybody with a VR headset has at home without any problem. Well, you talk about streaming from the cloud, but there was no latency as I moved. So was that a function of the fact that I was connected to a computer during the processing? 
I mean, are you going to be able to get that level of responsiveness of streaming from the cloud or, or not? No, it's completely possible to get that, that level of latency from the cloud, and we already uh, have been doing that. Here on the trade show, because of the Wi-Fi situation in the trade show, it's completely impossible to demonstrate it here, but uh, we already made some, some tests with really coming from uh, from the cloud, from instance from the cloud, and streaming to a headset. Actually, all the hard part, let's say, of the streaming is already done here in a way because we already have the rendering, uh, the compression and the decompression of the, well, the, or the encoding and the decoding of the image are already done. So what you will have here is we, you will add maybe 10 milliseconds to add for the network latency, which you don't have here. Here we look more about two milliseconds, but the rest of the chain actually stays the same. So yes, it, it works and we've, we've been making it work already. Is it fair to say that you know we're dealing with a, a canned presentation? So it is a movie, it's got a beginning and an end. You're adjusting how you experience with that. You're not, we're not branching, you're not changing outcomes. You're, you're, you're just controlling how you experience that experience. Yes, yeah, so uh, the experience could be a linear experience or the experience could be actually a branch experience. Nos nothing prevents you to actually having branching, which is, which we can have branching, which is uh, deliberate, let's say, that the viewer knows that is branching, like in this situation, would you like to go that way or that way, or would you like to see this uh, this this movie from this point of view or this point of view, or it could be also branching, which is unconscious. Like for instance, you're paying more attention to that detail, and then the movie will actually unfold and show you more things about what you are interested in. But those are kind of addition, let's say, on the system. But nothing prevents actually to have branching. We are kind of believers that when you have when you want to see a, a, a movie experience, what's interesting is to be actually drive by a director. So a director has a vision of the movie and he wants to share it with you and so you're kind of letting you go with the vision of the director rather than having something which is a game. So so how does this roll out commercially? What do you see as the first use? When do you see that happening? So I think that on the on the streaming part, one of the first use might be more to have shows, uh, which are which might be music shows, because we think that it makes it makes a lot of sense for people to, for instance, already book um, slots for servers on the cloud at a certain time for a certain show, and also the prices that people are ready to pay to actually have a, a, a close by experience with a with a showgoer. Uh, with a big artist, uh, will compensate perfectly for the price of the streaming, which is around uh, 50 cents to uh, around 50 cents per hour. So for a show, 50 cents per hour is completely okay. No, if it's something you propose for someone which will be looking at a lot of movies or even maybe playing, 50 cents per hour might be a problem at some point. But for a show, it's not a problem. And on top of it, Everybody is kind of used to booking slots in a show which normally are physical seats, but here the physical seats that you will book will be replaced by an instance of a server in the cloud. So that let, you know, what does that let me do that I couldn't do just watching a concert on a typical screen? Well, I think that the, the, the interest won't be to really watch the equivalent of a concert. Think more about being inside the, uh, the, the, the music video from Michael Jackson and Thriller. So you can be inside the music video with, with Michael Jackson uh, dancing and singing just in front of you, with the, uh, uh, with the undead guys singing and, and dancing in front of you. That will be a much more interesting experience than actually going to, well, it's interesting to, to well, you cannot anymore, but it was interesting to go to a Michael Jackson uh, concert. But usually you see Michael Jackson as a tiny person and you're usually watching basically the big screen in the show. Here you could be just one meter away and be in the, in the universe of the, uh, the artist rather than being among a crowd and looking at the show from the distance. What about training applications? What have you seen there? Honestly, for training applications, so this this is this is more linear uh, experience. So for training application, I think that more interacting VR might be a better solution. Okay, appreciate the honesty there. Listen, uh, thanks for taking the time. This is a great technology. Um, it's one of the most striking things that I saw at the show this year. Thank you very much.